Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Aubrey Reeves, CEO of Business and Arts. Before we begin, I just would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am a white settler speaking to you from Takaranto. I have the honor to be a guest on the traditional lands and waters of the Petun and Wendat peoples and the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee Confederacies, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River, as well as many other Indigenous nations, some of whose names are no longer remembered. By saying the names of its original keepers, we remember that this territory continues to be the subject of Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Three Fires Confederacy of the Anishinaabe to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We acknowledge all who came before us and have traveled the land and waters of this territory. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on these lands. Before we get started, there's just a couple of small housekeeping items for today's session. While I do that, we are going to launch a four question poll so everyone can tell us a little bit about yourself. So please uh, complete the poll. Meanwhile, um, we are happy to, uh, to have ASL interpreter Jenny Stevens with us here today. Auto-generated captions are also available in both English and French. You can turn them on in your control panel. Only the presenters and moderators will have our microphones on today. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box and vote for the ones you think are most relevant. The session is scheduled for one hour. Now I'd like to welcome today's moderator, Mary Rowe. Mary is the president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. Mary is a leading urban advocate and civil society trailblazer who has worked in cities and with communities across Canada and the United States. Mary is a frequent contributor to national and international city building programs, including UN Habitat, the Massey City Summit, the Art of City Building, and the World Urban Forum. She's a frequent media commentator and writer. Under Mary's leadership, CUI has expanded its work to include an international network from government and industry, community and city building professions to advance research and collaborate on solutions to some of our greatest urban challenges. Okay, so now um, I'm going to um, close the poll and we shall see the results. So uh, we can learn a little bit about um, who everyone is here um, in the audience today. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, first off, we can see that uh, the majority by a long shot, 61% are from urban centers um, in the audience today, which is great because so are, so are our speakers. Um, and we can also see that um, Though so there is 27% who think that their municipal arts and culture sector is thriving, um, the majority are a little less optimistic and, and think that it is somewhat thriving. So there's room for improvement in all of our municipal arts and culture uh, sectors. Um, our third question, do you feel there are current adequate resources? A strong majority is, uh, says no, that their municipality does not have adequate resources to grow the sector. And then our final question, um, do you feel that uh, the municipal's current structure has the capacity for uh, positive growth? Um, we have, a, yes, more optimism on that one for a positive for growth, but uh, still a strong um, a no and don't know there. So uh, I think that gives us some insight into today's discussion. And I'm going to close the poll now. And uh, Mary, you can uh, take over. Thanks, Aubrey. Well, I'm delighted to be with everybody and to have us coast to coast to coast. I'm actually at the far east uh, uh, of the country. I'm in the middle of the, not in the middle, I'm at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean in, on Fogo Island, which is a remarkable uh, story of where art and culture came together around nature and have created a really dynamic economy. If you don't know anything about what's been going on in, on Fogo Island, first of all, just Google it. It'll come up uh, and also look at the charity that operates all the social businesses that exist on the island, including the Fogo Island Inn. That is shorefast.org, which, which I'm a fellow. And uh, really great for me to be with you. Um, I'm going to ask people in the chat to just punch into the chat. How hot is it where you are? 
because I looked at the heat map. It's very hot here in Newfoundland, unlike unusually so. Uh, and uh, I, as a result, uh, you can see I'm a little bedraggled because it's, I'm perspiring because I don't really have AC over here. But I'd be interested if other people pop in the chat just how high the top temperature. Yes, exactly. Extremely hot, somebody said. Um, I think it's really interesting to us, all of us at this particular point. Thanks, gang, for putting in what you're doing. Um, if you look at a heat map, if you look at what's been going on in the last several weeks, uh, in Canadian communities, you'll see what we're looking at. Severe weather, uh, different kinds of circumstances, floods, extreme heat. Uh, out here on the shore, uh, across uh, in the Atlantic from Fogo, there are icebergs, little icebergs and big icebergs. It's July, whatever it is, the 18th. I mean, that is kind of crazy. Uh, that is not an encouraging sign that we are still seeing pieces of ice breaking off and coming down the Labrador Current on the 18th of July. So with that sobering note, Let's talk about the dynamics and the dynamism that culture and art bring to our communities and how do we elevate the importance of this as we're talking to, to policymakers and investors of all kinds as they start to continue, as they begin to think about what does the post-pandemic future look like for these places in the context of extreme weather events and all the economy, sorry, uh, uh, Jenny, I'm going so quickly, all the uh, economy, economic factors that are playing into complicating our lives together, all of us collectively, whether it's interest rates, whether it's inflation, whether it's scarce capital, all the different circumstances that we're experiencing, and then the particular challenges we're having in urban environments. Um, I was interested that uh, poll that went up, reflecting a little lower what the percentage of, of the Canadian population that lives urban, 61% on this call. Uh, it's a little higher in terms of almost 80% of the population live in a community of 5,000 or more. Makes us one of the most urban countries in the world. And so the question has to be then, how are we investing in these areas and what are the important things that make our urban environments livable and resilient and uh, socially just and all the different factors that go into uh, making our lives uh, productive and uh, resilient for us as people and also for us as a broader uh, society and country. So if I could ask our panelists to throw their cameras on, we're going to have an all go out chat here. Uh, we've got three parts of the country. We don't have the far west, uh, but we probably have someone from the west on the call somewhere else to carry on. But our three panelists come uh, from uh, the central parts, and I'm over here, as I say, on the far east today. And we're going to start as we often do. You know, I uh, host something for the, I should have said, actually, I'm the CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute, and I appreciate being invited to uh, moderate the discussion. We have a whole series of conversations that we've been having through COVID and uh, called City Talk. And we always start with just the premise of what's working, what's not, and what's next as a way to ground our conversations in really practical things. And during the pandemic, I used to say to people, a number of you, I think, I think, Patty, I know you have, and I think Patrick, you have, I don't know, Julian, whether you were ever on a city talk, but I always say, just go out your window and tell me what you're seeing. So in terms of grounding this conversation in the real, can you each give me a couple of minutes off the top about what you see as the, the reality for the culture sector at this moment, mid-July 2023, what are you seeing? What's working? What's not? But don't talk about what's next, but let's talk about what's working and what's not. Julian, can we go to you first? And everybody, uh, there's a, a bio on each of the speakers. They'll put it in the chat. Um, these are highly, highly accomplished people. As soon as they open your mouth, you're going to know that. Uh, and I appreciate them bringing their perspective because they are stewards, which is an extraordinarily important role. They are stewards of the public investment in our cultural and artistic life together. Such an important role. And I'm very appreciative they took the time and I'm really flattered they asked me to moderate them. So Julian, first to you, what's working and what's not in Montreal? Oh my God. <laughs> how long have it's we got? Yeah. yeah, how long have we got? Uh, so coming from uh, George Age, Montreal, uh, I mean, uh, first of you were trying to ask us, uh, you know, about the pandemic and uh, what we've been going through. I, I think it's kind of hard to say that we are recovering from the pandemic. I don't mm -hmm. think we are re recovering from anything right now mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, many uh, realities have changed. So, uh, and, and there are things that we see more vividly uh, than ever before, you know, uh, and cities have changed a lot. Uh, so hybrid work, for example, uh, is here to stay. And there are some realities that are harsher. You were talking, you were mentioning climate change. So, what I would what I would say uh, that we are tracking right now is really climate change and the effect we are seeing the effects of climate change in real time in our uh, cultural landscape. Yeah. So we've seen. Uh, I mean, it's not a landscape; it's a manufactured landscape. You know, the, right. the 
<laughs> so, right. and it needs to adapt to nature. So yeah. we are going back to a different type of adaptation. So we see fire, we see smogs, we see festivals uh, canceling shows. So yeah. that's what's happening right now and intense heat. So, um, so how do we adapt and how do we uh, empower artists to adapt in this context and, uh, and, and empower their, their voices? And um, the other things that are uh, um, issues that we are tracking is everything that revolves around the human aspects of making art uh, in cities, you know, uh, and that involves uh, labor shortages, shortages, you know, uh, financial stress, mm -hmm. um, inflation that is hitting uh, arts workers uh, really hard, and mm -hmm. uh, many workers leaving the the, the profession because um, uh, we saw that in the past, but now we see it more vividly that it's uh, more and more difficult to make a living because there are flaws in the uh, in the safety net. And on top of that, there's a housing crisis, and it's getting harder and harder to have uh, um, to access affordable and sustainable uh, uh, creative spaces in cities. Mm -hmm. So they are, but within that, <laughs> cities have adapted in ways that they had never done before, and uh, and artists have contributed to that in many many creative ways. So uh, that's in a it's, nutshell. You know isn't it interesting this, uh, I mean, who knew that we'd all, I mean, I'm noticing people in the chat saying, well, I'm going to talk to you about the, how hot it is, but I'm also going to talk to you about the smoke. And I have been in a number of the cities that are on the chat, people that are represented. In fact, I've been to all three of your cities. Patty, I was in Calgary when the smoke count was 200. You can't, I came out of my hotel and there was like this cloak of of weirdness. And as as you've just pointed out, Julian, the the dilemma is it's not just a phenomenon that we sort of remark on, it actually affects the viability of an artist's life, of the capacity to actually have a performance, whether or not the the, H, the HVAC system will sustain itself. So as you suggested, it has all these kind of cascading effects, uh, as well as obviously being topical uh, material that we have that that art and culture is trying to reflect these challenges in the, in the repertoires that we're seeing. So I'm going to come back to you about uh, spaces and how expensive spaces are because I think that's one of the critical things that we have to think about is do we have the space we need? Patty, let's go to you next in Calgary. Tell us what's working and what's not. And uh, nice to see you. Uh, over to you. You too, Mary. Thanks so much, and 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 thanks to Business and the Arts for uh, having us today on this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. What's working? Well, in, in Calgary, um, it's sort of a, an, an interesting dilemma. We're, we've just literally come off 10 days of the Calgary Stampede. We had our second highest attendance ever in 112 mm -hmm. years. Wow. And yes, we had three days of hazard warnings with uh, the fires uh, happening wow. in North Alberta. So it's clear that people want to gather. We had 1.38 million people come onto the park for the 10 days. Mm -hmm. We are just heading into Folk Fest, talking with the folks over there. They're expecting a really great turnout at Folk Fest on Princes Island. We have Expo Latino. So to your point, uh, Julian and, and Mary, um, um, the summer is proving to be a time when people want to come back and gather. And thankfully, um, uh, uh, they, they're they using the arts as a place to experience that. I think where we sit, and, and Julianne spoke about this a bit, coming out of COVID, it's not just COVID, right? It, in the last 10 years in Calgary, uh, June 22nd was 10 years since the 100-year flood. And wow. everything closed then. And then we had an economic downturn worse than the Great Depression. And then we had a worldwide pandemic, all in 10 years. And each one of those um, catastrophic events, because that's what they were for the arts community here, were bad. But to do three in 10 years just turned everything crazy to turbulence, right? Yeah. And so when we looked at the arts ecosystem in particular, um, coming out of these this 10 years of, of events, mm -hmm. the whole ecosystem, and I'm sure everybody on the call today could list dozens on their own experiences. Overall in the ecosystem, everybody suffered, but by and large, by far, the most severely impacted were individual artists. Mm -hmm. They were cut first and they were hired back last. Mm -hmm. And so that's a challenge. And, and for us here in Calgary, we are um, uh, for resetting 
uh, um, the arts ecosystem. Uh, we uh, just did our last four year strategic plan and we actually had the wonderful guidance of a Sutina man on our board and our elder from Gaina. And we took an indigenous worldview on the strategy. And so back to climate and nature. We adopted that view and we we drew a parallel between the natural system and the arts ecosystem. And in here in Alberta and Mohinstis, the buffalo was the keystone species in the natural system. And we know what happens when it was eradicated. It's terrible things. Well, in the arts ecosystem, artists are the keystone species. There's no arts ecosystem without them. And yet they have virtually been harmed in ways that often, you know, didn't necessarily have anything to do with the three bad catastrophic events, but with a system in what I deal with mostly, which is the nonprofit, mm -hmm. where, you know, a, a company had to cut its budget, a theater company, and they would go, well, instead of doing a six actor play, we're going to do a four actor play. Mm -hmm. so right away, artists are the one who have to bear the brunt. Mm -hmm. um, or instead of a this many people in our music right. ensemble, it's less. Like so, the, shrink the shrinkage is experienced by the performer, by the artist. That, li the, quite the actual literally. producer of the art. Yeah. And so then, you know, times that by artists don't get a discount on rent. They don't get a discount on a liter of gas. They don't get a discount on milk or bread. Right. They all have, they're dealing with the same inflation as anybody else. Yeah. Yet the extreme um, uh, shrinkage to your point, Mary. I yeah. think it's that. Um, um, I get, and then the one thing I, I will say as a, as a ray of light, I hope for us, is we have a municipal government here in Calgary that saw those challenges, that heard our case. And in 2018, we were at $6 million. And here we are in 2023, and our budget will be just shy of $20 million. Yeah. So fantastic. That, exactly. That part's fantastic, right? So we know that we have a government who hears us and who is believing the data that we are providing. And uh, so I see that as a, as a ray of hope. Is it enough? No, uh, but we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, this is part of what we're going to talk about is jurisdiction because, you know, it's sort of like arts and culture belongs to everyone and it belongs to no one. And that's one of the great challenges I see my colleagues nodding their heads and how I've been in these roles before where I've been trying to persuade it to belong to somebody and uh, they'll all say no no you know I mean we have some of this in housing too but it's it's as you suggest the fact that your municipal government had the foresight to say well actually we're going to triple our budget it's a wonderful example of of a, of a jurisdiction saying, I'm not, I'm not going to spend 10 seconds fighting about whose jurisdiction is. I'm just going to actually act. Okay. Let's go to Patrick next hot Toronto, smoggy Toronto, maybe not so much, but uh, uh, Patrick. Um, and I appreciate, thanks Aubrey for putting the detailed bios in the, the chat so people can read those uh, and uh, appreciate where these folks are coming from and what they've been doing. They're long time. I was uh, cautious saying that because it, codes that were older but uh you know they've been at it for a while so they've seen the goods and the bads and and the highs and the lows and that's why it's so valuable to put you in a, a panel like this for you to kind of compare notes so patrick over to you to talk to us about what's working what's not in toronto hey thanks marion thanks um business arts really appreciate the opportunity to do this uh julianne and, and patty have done a great job outlining some of the, the issues that in many ways are common to canada's big cities so i I won't go back over that. I'll I'll try to pick up from some things they've said. As Patty said, we need to understand this as sort of multiple uh, crises uh, compounding one another. And I think one of the things that we're noticing, and there was just data with respect to Canadian mental health outcomes right now, where it is not improving in in the in the aggregate sense, and and we have uh, mental health effects akin to the lowest points of the pandemic. So I think we've got to recognize that not only is it multiple crises, but uh, be very clear eyed about the toll of that. And I think uh, for some of the reasons Patty said, we had a vulnerable population in the form of artists, low incomes, exposure to the gig economy, um, first to close, last to open, et cetera. So the effects are reasonably are probably even more pronounced there. I think that is obviously eroding our resiliency at the level of individuals 
uh, and organizations both. I think at the level of individuals, as Julianne said, we are seeing a lot of churn, people leaving, a lot of people uh, coming as well, but it is creating a lot of flux. And the, the, the smaller the organization, newer the organization, sometimes these effects are more pervasive. We see this for medium-sized organizations serving diverse populations in Toronto, high levels of turnover at the ED level and systemic underinvestment in talent development for that cadre uh, across the board. Um, I think organizationally, we, we're entering into the tough time now, much as you know, we're talking about uh, small business needing to pay back loans, what the effects of leasing in our downtowns are. Like there's gonna be a long tail to this and there's mm -hmm. gonna be some lagging effects that are gonna become visible. So we're seeing organizations begin to enter into really critical phases and whether or not they have the organizational resiliency to ask themselves the tough questions and to get the help that sometimes is needed, we, we will see. But I'm sure as it is for me, I bet you Patty and Julian are spending a lot of time uh, in terms of intervening uh, with organizations that are facing really critical critical points. So I'll hold up there. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, Patty and Julian, feel free to turn your mics on and just leave them on. Don't feel you have to click them on, click them off, uh, because it's just us. It's just us chickens talking here. Um, uh, and you but know, I can board... I can double click on what pa Patrick was saying yeah, and, and Patty as well. I mean, right now uh, the extra work is the work, you know, and it's been a couple of years now, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we all look at our uh, initial mandates, uh, we go way beyond our mandates right now. And that's the way it should be. And and more than often, we act as a catalyst. We have nothing to do with the solution. We're mm -hmm. just uh, uh, gathering decision makers. And um, I mean, in Montreal, there's a social and political consensus on funding the arts and the importance of, of the arts in the, in the Montreal DNA and in Quebec's DNA. And sometimes uh, we help the city in uh, areas where they cannot act because they don't have the agility that we have as, a, as an arts council. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that uh, uh, there are things that are working and, and some of the um, uh, issues that we had to deal with during the, the pandemic uh, brought more a more collaborative uh, uh, way of working between agencies. In, in in many areas areas of Canada, I mean, uh, between the uh, five municipal arts councils, you know, uh, Toronto, mm -hmm. Calgary, Winnipeg, uh, uh, Edmonton, and and Montreal, we have a, we have a small group. We share a lot on mm -hmm. our concerns and and our realities, and we develop projects. Uh, and uh, and also at the um, Canadian Public Arts Funders. Uh, um, um, level there's a great national research group uh we exchange a lot on on data and and solutions and we share the same views on some major priorities you know when it comes down to equity and diversity uh indigenous rights indigenous governments uh tougher discussions on redistribution you know of of power and resources and uh, and um and climate change, you know, there are more gaps in terms of action in between uh, different uh, provinces and cities, but we share uh, the same uh, priorities at this point. And I think it's a it's it's a it's a positive thing, um, but we act more and more outside of our um, original mandates right now. That's what we do. You know, this is a very interesting pandemic phenomenon, where I've described this before that because we were in a heightened state of urgency. You know, and people had to be aware that uh, if there was something in front of them that needed to be doing, need to be done, there wasn't time to spend 10 seconds wondering if it was in your job description or not. You just had to do it. And, you know, whether that was getting public washrooms into parks or whether it was realizing that we had to help small businesses learn how, you know, to be able to accommodate, to do takeout, to do the big pivot. And, you know, I wonder about that, that agility, Julian, you know, that because I, I worry that people can function on adrenaline only so long, and then they start to pull back and say, wait a sec, you know, I've got to have some balance in my life. But because it's almost as if we expect artists to do everything. You know? <laughs> and, and as Patty said, you know, they're the last in and the first out. And so at what point do we take advantage of the resourcefulness of artists? And we're just asking too much. Patty, have you wrestled that to the ground? 
Do you, what do you yeah. think the answer is? Obviously more income support, I think would be fundamental, right? Well, you know, I mean, among the many initiatives that Julianne speaks to, um, got, was it two years ago now, Julianne, where five cities got together and wrote an op-ed about the merits of basic income. And uh -huh. I know there's lots Perfect. of debate, lots of, is it basic income? Is it a guaranteed income? Like Whatever right. it is, it, at the heart of it, it rests in the role and the values that artists bring to civil society. Mm -hmm. That as municipal funders, we see it firsthand on the ground. We sure. see the merits from an instrumental as much as an intrinsic, right? You know, I, I mean, I'm going to go yep. to focus this summer and I know I'm going to be taken away. My breath will be taken away many times over and it will have nothing to do about my mental health. It will have nothing to do with, you know, how I need to be socialized and it will have everything to do with hearing the music and mm -hmm. feeling it in my heart and being moved by it. Mm -hmm. So that's the value of municipalities. We are, we are literally in those openings. We are seeing these folks in the coffee shop. We're watching them do their second job as a waiter or an Uber driver, and then go do their gig over at the Ironwood. So mm -hmm. we see the way these artists are making their lives, right? Different from how they might make a living. And we do an, um, an artist survey every couple of years, you know, again, as one of our information gathering efforts, every single one of them talks about how their living is supplemented, right? Either they have a second job or they're living with others or they have a partner who has a full-time job or those things. So we know it is supplemented in some way. And right. I think for us, it's about recognizing that you're an artist all the time whether the majority of your income comes from that practice if you're devoting your livelihood and your life then you're an artist and i think making that clear to citizens is certainly telling the story right is also as much as i see artists every day i also see calgarians so i can mm -hmm. tell i can be on stampede park and i can mm -hmm. show them the western art oasis and mm -hmm. i can show them the two days of powwow and i can show them the role that artists bring in connecting us and telling our story um and even in wearing our regalia of cowboy hats and blue jeans and a cowboy shirt for 10 days mm -hmm. it connects us and mm -hmm. that's the key to me. And, and we're, we're the ones on the ground who are, this is the, this is the glue, right? This Absolutely. is the glue. And, and what's, what's interesting to me listening to you in, in my role at CUI is that you could be talking about almost any aspect of urban life, yeah. whether it's housing or social services or mental health support or transit. And the municipal worker says the same thing that you're saying, that you're the closest to the recipient of the service or the expression of the of a UK culture. And you know, and you are the one that's interacting with them in their whole life. Uh, and, and I think this is such an interesting illustration of a really really fancy word. If anybody's been coming to City Talk, they've heard me mention it before. Here's a word to Google. Talk about it at dinner table tonight, subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a concept that's very common in Europe. We don't embrace it as much as we need to in Canada, which is that the order of government closest to the recipient of the service should be the one that is administering, setting the policy, implementing, and funding, and then held accountable for it. Instead, we have this system where the money, you know, all the Hazel McCallion, the late mayor of Mississauga, said that the government of Canada has all the money. The provinces have all the power and the municipal governments have all the problems. And that <laughs> is the dilemma we live with yeah. in our existing system. So as we look on, as we look forward, it seems to me that this uh, this collaborate, collaborative environment that you yeah. said, Julian, was actually birthed before the pandemic. Yeah. But then during the pandemic, we all sort of got with the program like, shit, we better talk to each other. This notion of, of regional collaboration and intergovernmental collaboration, can you talk to me a little bit about how, what that looks like from your perspective? Um, because again, you're the ones closest to the action in every way. And it would seem to me that the provincial and federal governments are dependent on you to be able to inform that the kinds of programs they develop. Patrick, can you talk to me a little bit about what the collaborative environment looks like in Ontario? And what you're, and I know you work nationally too, so feel free to answer at whatever scale. Sure, Mary. Um, yeah, that's really the genesis for this conversation, is that we share common challenges which flow from 
owning all the costs, but not yep. controlling uh, right. all of the, the inputs. So uh, I'll say a couple of things that may sound ungrateful in a day that the federal government just signed off on 97 million to help us address our refugee crisis. But when I worked for a settlement agency, our tagline with respect to the dynamic you just described, Mary, was federal government, yes to immigration, no to immigrants. And some days right. when you work on cultural policy, it feels like federal government, yes to art, no to artists. Yeah. Um, because we need the mm. revenues as cities to be able to provide, not just for artists, but artists, uh, for the reasons we've all described, feel these things quite acutely. We need the revenues to be able to meet the demands that not only are uh, are, are, are by design, but increasingly are, are downloaded to us. Um, there's, you know, it, we are very thankful for that 97 a million for refugees, but I'll tell another joke at the, again, at the risk of sounding a bit ungrateful. And that is sometimes it feels like when you work in a city that with respect to the other orders of government, uh, it's a bit like being the child of an absentee parent. You know, they yeah. show up uh, every month or two months with a big stuffed giraffe. And that's amazing, but they're behind on the child support payments. Yeah. So that's a bit our dynamic. We need a structural fix. Hazel yeah. McCallion's assessment of that mismatch in responsibilities and revenues stands true evermore today as we've effectively absorbed some de facto downloading with respect to what are had been called COVID costs, but are now structural costs borne by municipalities, but quite properly fall into the domain of the of the federal and provincial government, a lot of them relating to, to healthcare. So I'm, I'm sorry to go on a little bit of a rant, uh, but the cities do need the tools and we need to be in the conversation. You think of things like cultural infrastructure, we get some big stuffed giraffes in the form of cultural infrastructure, but we are not sitting at the table, you know, doing an asset mapping, bringing our own equity to the table because where we may not all have cash, We've got assets, and if we don't have that, we've got the regulatory environment and the land use planning. We can make these things go, or if we're not in the conversation, they can die for the failure to adequately contend with the what's on the ground. So I'll, I'll wrap up there, but uh, yeah. It, it was a good, you were on a good roll though, that <laughs> good rant. You know, I, I've just spent two weeks, Julian, in, in, your, in your province, and I just want to call out here that Julian is working in English. We appreciate him doing that. Um, but I've just spent two semaines à la, la Belle Provence, and I was really struck by how visible the commitment of the provincial government is to culture and to art. I, it's visible to someone who isn't living there. You probably don't notice it as much, but boy, oh boy, when you're from away, you do. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about why, I, it's historical, I appreciate but somehow you've been able to stitch together a relationship between uh, the, the uh, municipal level and the provincial level. And then the feds, I think, come piling in after, after you've already got provincial support. I don't know how Patty and Patrick would describe their experiences in their jurisdictions as quite the same. So, Julian, give us a little, a little hint. Because you seem, I mean, I know it's not. Oh, I don't, I don't know the there. secret to the recipe. I think there's a social uh, consensus. Yeah. It's yeah. uh, it's it really consensus. has to do it really yeah. has to do with the uh, with the uh, our culture the fact that we are um, deeply uh, we deeply care about uh, French uh, the, the French language and also that um, that we care about uh, having um, an art sector that is uh, that is uh, resilient uh, that can also uh, travels abroad you know. Um, um, Represent uh, mm -hmm. the diversity of voices uh, outside mm -hmm. of, uh, of of Quebec, mm -hmm. um, but still, I, I want to go back to 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 one of the topics that was mentioned before. You know, oh. you, were, you were asking about improvements. You know that, mm -hmm. and because uh, the mandate of Arts Council is is still is still clear. We we oftentimes go outside of our mandate, but our impact right now is somehow getting uh, limited because. Um, Resources are not uh, uh, expanding, uh, and uh, and one of the flaws is the the status of artist. You know, mm -hmm. the House of Commons Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage issued a report with twenty recommendations on the status of the artist, and uh, at the same time there was a bill regarding the central role of artists. You know that failed to to progress beyond the, the first reading in Parliament. 
uh, you can read uh, Zainub's uh, Verge's uh, 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 article on this. That it's very uh, uh, interested and. And you know the the report really ad addresses the need for uh, reform in the employment insurance program for artists, the implementation of artists' yep. uh, resale right, you know, to ensure fair compensation yep. for their work. Because what we are seeing at the same time uh, under our eyes, you know, is the rise of AI, and uh, so the last bits of artistic uh, uh, value are being commodified and for a small fraction of corporations, you know, uh, whether it's a mini music industry in design, illustration, uh, um, and, you know, the actor strike in Hollywood is affecting us uh, and it's affecting the, the Canadian uh, movie industry. But at, at the core of what our government should be acting, and we think uh, municipalities are at the forefront of, the, of those issues because our impact is getting limited, uh, is that we need to ensure a, a more robust and a decent uh, a safety net for artists. So there are a number, there are 20 recommendations. So they, we don't we don't need to redo the recommendations. They've been done already. And right. been, there, ha there has been extensive consultation within uh, uh, artists, uh, professional artist uh, uh, groups and artists themselves and many people with the uh, 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 researchers and with uh, lots of insights on, on what the solutions might be. So this is a key issue. <laughs> and yeah. we, we raised our voices, uh, cities, you know, five municipal uh, arts council raised their voices on this. So uh, so I don't know what the secret is in, in Quebec, but we truly believe that artists are, uh, are central to our society. Mm -hmm. And we and we also need to trust them in finding uh, solutions, in uh, and in 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 helping them uh, um, um, living a decent life, mm -hmm. uh, because they uh, they matter to us. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's central, and as you suggest, it's central to the cultural identity in Quebec, which is uh, has pluses and minuses, obviously. There's lots of challenge associated with that as well. Patty, you mentioned the notion of, of it's instrumental and it's intrinsic. And I think that's an interesting needle to thread. We've somehow been able, somebody in the chat is commenting on this about the extent to which the consumers of culture and art are both our friend and our enemy, right? If it gets instrumentalized too much and we, we cater too much to the tourism economy, then we end up favoring a particular branch of artistic life versus a more sort of holistic approach. And you just you just described it beautifully when you said, I've just had 10 days of the stampede. <laughs> and there you are. There it is in a nutshell, right? But but as And I loved your phrasing that they're making their lives. It's not just they're making their living, they're making their lives. So this knitting it knitting it together that it's that it's like breathing right that somehow this kind of expression and these opportunities to be engaged in artistic endeavor is part of our society it's our lungs right absolutely and i think that you know it 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 that's the beautiful thing about cities and and certainly canada well in calgary we're canada's third most diverse city and so even this whole like distinction between arts and culture yeah, help me with that, will you? Before, mm -hmm. and it's way more blurry now. Yeah. And I think that, you know, certainly from Calgary's perspective, what does it mean to be Canada's third most diverse city? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is it an in-between thing? I don't know. We right. know it's not equally reflected. It's not equitably reflected, even within our own arts funding portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I know there have been lots of questions coming up and I've been trying to read them and, and I'll and try we're to- gonna, We're going to go to them. Don't worry. I can, but yeah. um, I think the thing for us here um, it is- how do we ensure that more artists are at the table? You know, every single one of us, the creative economy and creative opportunity and creative cities and creative, the creative art, like creativity is one of those things. The more you do it, the better you get at it. It's not like you were born with the creativity gene and your, your yeah. SOL, if you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Artists practice creativity every single day. They are the elite. They are the athletes of the creativity sport or whatever you want to call it. And so why wouldn't we invest in that? Why, you know, and the output, the outcome of creativity is innovation. Mm -hmm. So for any city, any rural jurisdiction, anybody who's talking about being more innovative, mm -hmm. if you 
sometimes including artists in that conversation and in that pursuit, you're actually biting off your nose to spite your face. You well, are. Sure, I mean, face. surely to God, we've won that discussion. I don't know if we have though. That that I the idea that if you want to invest in a workforce, you need to you know you need to strengthen the capacity that the artistic capacity. Pat, you're in a cult. You're in a city that is that has a large cultural industry. Uh, some of which are suffering right now because of that strike, the writer's strike in various circumstances and the mental health challenges you just described, uh, which as Patty and both uh, Julian and Patty have mentioned, the more vulnerable sector of the artistic community is being buffeted badly by uh, first first in, uh, last in, first out. So do you have a sense of how those two, when you're working with your colleagues sitting around departmental meetings, yeah. is there a way to have a conversation that embraces both the vulnerable artist and the mental health challenge that we're seeing on the street? So, yeah, let me, I'm, I'm going to answer in a slightly different way, Mary. Sure, which, sure. Yeah. Um, the, I'm going to go back to Patty's point because you're right, the, the effects of the Hollywood strikes is going to be enormous. 70% um, of our production is service production, is U.S. production, so they're all down. Yep. Um, we have 30 productions normally this time. We have six. Now, why wow. I'm raising that is it's, and it looks like they're going to hunker down. It's going to be longer than anyone would hope. But Patty's right. We got to get rid of this false taxonomy between not-for-profit arts and the creative industries. And then because they they overlap at this point, but in in a fashion that we don't really enable or maximize the, the linkages within. So knowing how Mary Rowe, you love a practical, uh, practical outcome, uh, we are all in a conversation, Julien just referenced with the Canada Council uh, about redistribution or how we approach arts funding. One of the things we have to do is sort of tear down these false dichotomies uh, across the spectrum of heritage, arts and creative industries. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, nowhere is that more important than in cities where usually the, the new business models are emerging and innovation is is taking place. And I think that holds true for the cultural sector as well. And I, I think things are going to get tough. I'll just close on you know another point about what we should be working on. Festivals are under a lot of stress, whether as, as Julian says, cancellations due to climate uh, or just the rising 300% increases in the input costs around insurance and security, et cetera. So the federal government has bailed out a component of the festival sector for, for a very good reason around threat assessments. However, we are now pitting uh, parts of the sector against each other, and mm -hmm. we need a, a national conversation because those same pressures are facing everybody. And we've got a lot of festival organizers in a really precarious state right now. Mm -hmm. So we've all got to come together on that one. So a couple practical uh, suggestions of where we go from here. Uh, you know, I have a, an interest, a particular interest in festivals because public space and the the conviviality of us sharing spaces, cultural spaces of whatever they are, it's so critical to uh, the livability of a city and its resilience that we actually are willing to come back into proximity with one another. And as we know, in some cities across the country, we've got concerns around safety on transit. Uh, we've got uh, 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 people are more fearful. And so I just feel this is this big collective enterprise that we need. And could there be a more important sector to that than art? I'm not sure. Uh, and artists who will help us get back to feeling OK with each other in that kind of environment. And then, as you suggest, festivals is the the man. That's the that's the manifestation at s different times of seasonality because you don't have the venue cost and you don't have the input costs. But we still have people being fearful, right? And how are we going to overcome that? I was in, uh, Julian, I was in the Quartier de Spectacle um, mm -hmm. in June, and it was emptier than I was used to seeing it, uh, considerably emptier. I don't know whether it's rebounded in the last three or four weeks, but, you know, in downtowns across yeah. the country, not everybody has what you have. So hybrid work has, has impacted the, the way uh, urban calls are, are made. Yeah. And so I think there's, there are opportunities for artists and arts organizations to rebuild cities. Mm -hmm. from the ground up you know there are right. cities where uh, there's office buildings that are completely empty right now but right. we don't have the uh, the right regulations or the right zoning uh, to allow for a more hybrid space we are in a hybrid work mode now we yep. need more hybrid uh, space where artists can play a role in uh, in in, in um, reconnecting uh, uh, everyone 
And so I can, I can give you some examples of positive uh, <laughs> projects Good. that we've done Let's in the do past that. three years, for example, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, we had an issue with the uh, creative spaces in Montreal where uh, uh, organizations could not afford or were failing at uh, developing their real estate projects. And so we developed a pilot project involving um, uh, the, um, social economy enterprises that are dedicated to uh, the development of community housing mm -hmm. who knew nothing about developing art spaces and we connected them with uh, arts organizations who knew nothing about real estate and That's so great. out of the 17 projects within that three year we got some major achievements you know, most, uh, most of the projects got to a different phase and some of them went to a very big phases where, uh, uh, for example, Atelier Belleville, uh, with the support of the Groupe de Ressources Techniques, you know, just purchased a 55,000 square foot building for a, a price of 6.2 million, thanks to uh, the city of Montreal and the government of Quebec and other funders. So, and, and we were trying to build capacity and to document that capacity building project. So these are really concrete examples of where different types of governments are involved. And us as a council can act with more agility where the city wasn't being able to act on this, but they had much larger uh, pockets with the government. So coming all together, and, and convening people together and trying to innovate with people that are coming completely from the left field. We are not talking to each other. We achieved great things. And uh, an upcoming project that we're working on is uh, an innovation, an innovative um, innovation lab for creative, creative space. So mm -hmm. different cities in, in are collaborating on this, uh, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. Uh, us in Montreal, we are running our own. We, each city is running their own labs with the support of the Canada Council and the uh, Power Corp uh, in, in, in Montreal. Good. And so we'll be looking at innovative uh, solutions, really building solutions with many stakeholders. And at the end, the council might not have to do anything with the solution. We're just trying to gather people. Generate. Generate gen innovative ideas. solutions. So philanthropy might be involved. Uh, mm -hmm. social innovation, social economy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, um, the private sector as well, and many different uh, levels of governance in building a more resilient, uh, resilient infrastructure for the You arts. know, this idea of hybrid, hybridity, or whatever we're going to call it, it's everywhere now. Everything is so that we need to have flexible spaces of all kinds. Flexible spaces that can be adapted to creative use, can be adapted to retail, can be adapted to housing. Can we, I hope, we're going to move to that meanwhile lease different kinds of arrangements to bring people into using the assets we've got because we do have calgary you're the poster child for this you've got all these empty office floors that you had before covid you're repurposing for housing i'm hoping are is it are you also thinking about cultural uses in some of those empty buildings absolutely recently right. so the city has a downtown strategy uh that's actually we've got cities from all over north america looking at it Mm -hmm. We actually have a specific fund that is about office to live to um, accommodation space or housing mm -hmm. uh, subsidy. So there's that. And it's just recently opened up to include office conversion to cultural space. Yeah. So oh, that's good. We don't know what that looks like yet, but it's 145 million in total. That's being um, that's currently in the envelope and we hope it will increase. And it is about getting more artists in the downtown to live and work. And, and I think that's something that Julianne raised here. It's not only about performance venue and rehearsal venue, it's also about an affordable space to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if, we, if we don't deal with artists in that way, then, then I think we're doing ourselves a, a disservice. Such a critical part of the economy is the artistic life, but also the labor force, the workforce, the population, all that kind of thing. And if we segment and make it impossible for people who are engaged in this kind of activity to live near where they create, then we just, we don't, we haven't learned from the past very well. We know that we want diverse communities where we can all exist. Question in the chat here from somebody asking in the Q&A. Thanks folks for putting these in. Someone's asking, what about the rural? Um, and what do you think the relationship is between uh, urban and the peripheral rural and non-urban? Um, do you do you have a sense that artists have left? Is there a is there a bit of a, a COVID dividend happening where artists are able to go and find cheaper housing and cheaper space in the periphery? Or are they coming back in? Is it both and? Anybody want to comment on that, Patrick? Yeah, I'll take a quick shot and pass it over. 
Um, there's churn. So okay. uh, when you, if you surveyed artists as the Toronto Arts Foundation did in 2019, 69% report being from outside of Toronto. And there's a lot, the narrative is that artists are fleeing the cities. They are, and a greater number are arriving. So there's a net um, increase and the Canada Council is, is tracking uh, this, but that's, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of, you know, uh, the median income uh, for artists in this city is 30K. You need 70K to be able to afford the median monthly rent on a one bedroom, which is $2,450. So they're well below uh, what, is, what is livable in this city. And that's, that's why I argue for the type of long-term financial fix that cities need to be able to provide these goods in the form of affordable housing and creative spaces so that artists can can stay, raise a family, make a career. Yeah, I mean, this is and, part, this yeah. is part of the diversity equation, yeah. right? We we, we think, need to have, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Julian. Canada Council is working on on the on the on the massive surveys on on to see, you know, the data on if artists have really left uh, some of the major cities. In Montreal, it doesn't show as as of now that there's a massive uh, um, uh, exile. I don't know how to do that. But the, one one quick data is that the uh, right now the uh, availability percentage of uh, uh, housing is 2% in Montreal right now on the island. It's 0% in the rural uh, areas right now. There's no availability. So the housing crisis is also hitting out in rural areas right now. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the, I know. It's, it's getting more complex uh, uh, for even for artists to uh, uh, go outside of cities to, to make a, a, a better a better living. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've always had an interdependency. I always, uh, my engagement here at Fogo Island, you know, it's mostly about rural uh, and the founder of the of Shorefast and the Fogo Island initiatives. And I always say it's the same conversation. Like it's a false dichotomy. This We've always been interdependent, urban and rural. And we've always had lots of backing and forthing and mixing. And part of the benefit of the pandemic has been the technology kind of pushed us into a place where there's a, you can operate a little more choice. But the truth of it is the mental health challenge and the housing challenge we've just identified is in almost every community of every size. Uh, and that's the collective uh, moment we're, we're having. So as we move forward, as Canada moves forward, and as we think about what our priorities need to be, what are our federal spending priorities need to be, provincial spending priorities, you three are on the ground. You are the closest to the vibrant uh, contribution that artists and the cultural sector make and how essential they are. Um, thoughts on what you think the priorities should be, let's say, for the fall economic statement this fall or for the budget of 2024, federal budget of 2024, or what do you see advocating at, at your own councils uh, and with your provincial colleagues? What are your priorities? Julian, I'll go to you first, then Patty, then Patrick. I mean, the status of the artist first. Okay. <laughs> I would say we need to fix that for good. Uh, otherwise, we won't, we'll have the same conversation over and over. And uh, that will leave a hole really empty. Uh, the other thing is space. Invest okay. in empowering artists to uh, to to be uh, uh, to own their space and uh, make sure that the programs really suit the, the needs from the ground and get the artists to find the solutions. That's what we did with some of our programs, and, and it showed that uh, they're ready. <laughs> they're ready to to be empowered. Um, and climate change. There's no way we 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 won't do anything if we don't uh, empower uh, artists uh, to adapt and also have them a part of the uh, discussion of the solutions, right? Of the solution and artists. the discussion, the narratives. Yeah. And um, yeah. That's I mean, it's uh, artists. My top the three. artists. Them the artists themselves, the space to be able to be creative and actually have a make a living or make their lives, as Patty said, and then to contribute to this big overarching poly crisis of which climate is, we're in the midst of it. I mean, artists have traditionally helped us through all these things. So we need to walk hand in hand in those things. Patty, three things that you think should be the priorities or two or one. 
I, well, I kind of divided mine into federal, provincial, municipal. Okay. So at the federal level, I think to Julianne's point, these national or world global issues around climate change, social justice, mm -hmm. um, these things that are affecting all of us, irrespective of rural, urban, small, big, whatever. Yeah. I think there's something in that. I think guaranteed income addressing that on a broader scale. Obviously, I'm more concerned with artists given my role, but that conversation at the provincial level, I think that is where we can start to address this, this integrating of rural urban, right? renew the narrative that's a huge issue for us in alberta given oh, the yeah. rural mlas that mm -hmm. form government um the other thing for us is you know i mean cada's 20 million dollars edmonton arts council is 19 million dollars our provincial partner is 24 million dollars it's not enough so we're actually as cities advocating to increase the budget to the to the provincial body to 50 million in order to ensure a province-wide and, and to get that collaborative interdependent relationship strengthened rather Absolutely. than rather than in any way adversarial you get I, it's not a zero-sum game right we've got to right. send, like the lift all boats thing patrick exactly. last word to you and then i'll go back to aubrey go ahead patrick priorities all right thanks mary um we have three quick ones one you know someone wisely once said that canada is a country of perpetual pilot projects we need structural fixes. And, and Mary did great work at the CUI delivering the healthy community initiatives, but mm -hmm. we, we need culture to be understood as a critical yeah. component of healthy communities and funded to that extent through standing programs. In addition to the cities needing a long-term structural fix to our, 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 our chronic underfunding. Um, I think also uh, culture as a, as a public good, the Ontario government did something interesting by changing its tax laws to allow live music venues to get a break of 50% on their property tax assessment, which is subsidized by other ratepayers in that property tax class, meaning that they've established culture as a public good worth subsidization even by other right. small businesses. So more of that, let's push that. Uh, and then finally, with respect to Ontario, yeah, similarly, we've, we've seen a proportional decrease in the provincial component of funding, uh, you know, as a share of other public funders. So we'd like to reverse that trend, but we would also specifically love to see a standing cultural infrastructure program so we can have tripart conversations around what are the right investments and how we make them sustainable. We got to move beyond the pilot. That's it. Culture. Hey, Mary, insane. Mary, can I, can I just add one? Very one last quickly, bit? Julian. Yeah. 6% of donations are made to the arts in Canada. Philanthropy is a matter, it's a public policy decision. Anything that can help that is a good is a good decision. Is a win. Is a win. Thanks, gang. What a great pleasure to be with you. Go ahead, Aubrey. It's over to you. Thank you, everyone. What a lively and thought-provoking discussion. Um, so exciting. Um, thank you to Patrick Tovin, Patty Pont, and Julianne Zalmari uh, for participating in the session. Merci. And thank you to Mary Rose of the Canadian Urban Institute for moderating today's exciting session. Um, I learned a lot uh, about the role of municipalities in the cultural ecosystem, and I think our audience did too. But also, I learned a lot about the challenges and responsibilities you hold in that ecosystem. Uh, we would like to also extend a thank you to Power Corporation of Canada, who is the presenting partner of the Business and Arts Speaker Series. We'll be taking a break from the speaker series in August, but we will be back in September with the next Arts Response Tracking Survey. So to learn more about any business and arts programs and initiatives, uh, please visit businessandarts.org or follow us on social media. Have a wonderful summer, everyone, and we'll see you in September. Bye-bye.